Imagine yourself walking into a library where you can check out original scrolls from such great thinkers as Aristotle, Euclid and Archimedes. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, this place did exist at a point in time. Now, you may be wondering what on earth happened to this magnificent and largest library of the ancient world. Welcome to Intrigued Mind and join us in unfolding one of the greatest crimes against humanity. The burning of the Library of Alexandria. Before we delve deeper into the library's demise, let's discuss how and why it was built in the first place. In 336 BCE, Alexandra the Great of Macedon led his army on successful campaigns that spanned from Greece to Egypt, through the Middle East and even reaching the far corners of India. Alexander was a student of Aristotle and fascinated with Greek culture and history. Greek society at the time was in the Golden Era, where studies in philosophy, architecture, mathematics, astronomy and the arts and many more areas flourished. Through his conquests, he was able to expand and integrate this culture into new lands. Alexandra's conquests started the Hellenistic world, the Hellas being the Greek word for Greece. After Alexander the Great's death in 323 BCE, his four trusted generals divided the Macedonian Empire amongst themselves. The most successful out of the four was Ptolemy I, who gained control of Egypt. While the other three generals were fighting about land and politics, Ptolemy was the only one who attempted to make Alexandra's dream come true a vision of blending the East and West and creating a multicultural world. He started with changing the capital of Egypt from Memphis to Alexandria to become the major economic and cultural center. Importantly, he mandated his empire to worship Serapi, a deity that blended the Egyptian and Greek god Zeus and Osiris. To honor the cult of Serapi, Ptolemy I built the great temple of Serapium. Accompanying this temple was a research institute known as the Masion, or the Shrine of the Nine Greek Muses. Included in this research institute was, you guessed it, the Great Library of Alexandria. But what made this library so great? Aside from its religious use, it was guided by the principle that knowledge is power. All ancient libraries, such as Library of Ashibanipal or the Library of Constantinople, were notable because they gathered scholars from all around the world and housed great ancient literary works. However, what makes this library stand out from the rest was its aim to rival any institution in Athens, which, at the time, was the birthplace of knowledge. In order to rival such Athenian libraries and institutions, Ptolemy II, the next in line to the throne, assigned a group to run the library. One of them was the ex-Athenian politician Demetrius of Phalerum. The task given to him to collect, if possible, all the books in the world. How did he and the rest of the assigned men do this? they used two main methods. The first tactic they used to acquire original documents was to rent the scrolls from other owners of libraries for a number of gold and silver pieces, have the scribes copy them and return the copy instead. They tell the owner to keep the gold. The second method used in acquiring books was a clever use of the library's geography with Alexandria being the hub joining the eastern and western Mediterranean world, ships from all around would dock there. To help the library's collection grow, it was mandated by the pharaoh, a Ptolemy, that each ship was to be searched for books. If a book was found, it was taken to the library for a scribe to copy it. The original book would again be taken by the library, and a copy would be returned to the ship. 
Hence, a category at the library named From the Ships was created aside from other categories such as mathematics, anatomy, geography and many more. While these were pretty strong-arm tactics to go about building a library, they certainly yielded results. The library would have a vast collection of original scrolls and manuscripts that would attract researchers, thinkers and literary figures from all over the ancient world. However, what made the Great Library of Alexandra different from other ancient libraries was not just their goal of garnering scrolls from around the globe, but to attract the writers themselves, to turn it into a place that would become not only a repository, but a source of ideas. Disciples such as geometry, geography and astronomy thrived as students and sages frequented the library. An example would be Aristophanes, who is the father of geography, who visited the library circa 240 BCE. He was able to calculate the Earth's distance from the Sun and predicted the leap year of 366 days every fourth year by using the knowledge contained in the Library of Alexandra along with his research. These ideas and many more in the late centuries BCE were ahead of their time and were only made possible by this combination of historical knowledge and present scholasticism in one place. Still, this library was not open to just anyone. It was part of a research center, so the Ptolemaic rulers of Egypt gave scholarships and allowed access to scientists, philosophers and poets to the collection and offered them to live in Alexandria. The Ptolemies offered scholars free board, tax exemptions, servants and salaries often for life. Scholars enticed by these measures included Euclid, Hierophilus, Strabo and even Archimedes. In exchange, the rulers would get advice from the scholars on how to rule their country, which proved effective as the Ptolemaic era lasted almost three centuries. What started off as a collection of religious traditions turned into a vast collection of 200,000 books by the end of the 3rd century BCE, with topics ranging from poetry to astronomy to mathematics. By the end of the 2nd century BCE, it was around 700,000 books. No wonder they called it the Great Library of Alexandria. However, as Chaucer once said, well, a slightly modified version of it, all great things must come to an end. The library was destroyed. The Library of Alexandra is one of academic history's greatest losses. Yet, we are not sure exactly how it occurred. Researchers have come up with different theories over the years as to how this occurred. There are four main theories today we will discuss that range from Caesar's fires to Muslim ransacks to the theory historians claim to be the most true today. So make sure you stay until the end. The Siege of Alexandra in 45 BCE, led by Julius Caesar, has been blamed for the fires that led to its destruction. As written by Plutarch, when Julius Caesar was forced to repel the danger by using fire, and this spread from the dockyards and destroyed the great library. This account is unconvincing though, as 30 years after the siege there is literary evidence of scholars still going to the library. In fact, there is evidence of people going 300 years later. In addition, it was not the library that was near the port, but the warehouses that only contained manuscripts. So perhaps some part of the collection was burnt, but not the library itself. The second suspected theory wouldn't occur until 4th century CE, when the Roman Emperor Theodosius issued a decree outlawing pagan practices. Allegedly, as a result, Christian soldiers destroyed the Temple of Serapi in Alexandria altogether, with its many documents which were mostly stored in the Great Library. The library was then converted into a Christian church. 
Although much this decree did occur and likely much knowledge was lost as a result around the Roman Empire, no ancient sources mention the destruction of a library in Alexandria during this time. Beyond that, it is now believed that the library that was destroyed and converted into a church was a different, smaller library. Moving on to the third possible theory, it occurred in the 5th century CE involving the second caliph or religious leader of the new Islamic empire, Omar. However, this theory is generally rejected as historians found that Muslim leaders at the time commanded the preservation of captured religious texts. According to historians, Islamic adherents were too fond of books and learning to destroy such a place. This theory was likely floated over history to place the destruction at the hands of a rival religion, Islam. So, given that all the historical accounts discussed have generally been debunked, what really happened to the library? The fact is, with the weakening of empires comes the decay of their institutions and relevance to the world at that time. Even if the siege of Julius Caesar was the first candle that started the proverbial fire of the great library, we know that the library itself was in use for several centuries after that. As much as we want to believe that there was a dramatic end to this great library, the fact remains that institutions more often decline slowly rather than in disaster. In the end, the library's demise was due to the lack of funding as its relevance faded away like the empire that founded it. To maintain such a large library required sponsors and a staff, in other words a lot of money, for it to remain as great as it was. Although still in use, the library and its temples were but a memory of what they were in the heyday in the 2nd century CE. Simply put, its time was up. So, was it a crime against humanity? Many have made the claim that the burning of the Library of Alexandria set humanity's progress back a thousand years. However, it is much more likely it simply faded away with time as resources to maintain the facility ran bare. But many researchers stated that even if the library and its works were lost in time, intellectual progress was still preserved. The most influential works of antiquity survived. Although we only have fragments of their writings, we have enough to know the main ideas and build on them, and it is seen in the knowledge we have today. Nevertheless, it was not humanity that was set back, but history itself. In history, you need all the pieces of the puzzle to know its full value. So, we will never truly know what happened. Although the Great Library is not of the seven wonders of the ancient world, like its neighbour, the Lighthouse of Alexandria, it was still a wondrous achievement. As said by author Heather Phillips in her essay about the library, it was a dream made into a reality, and it served its purpose as one that we would marvel at in history as one of the greatest libraries man has ever made. What do you think is the greatest thing man ever made? Let us know in your comments below and we might make a video on it. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel. Like the video and leave your suggestions in the comments below.